That's my problem. Patients are too high. You need to lower your expectations way down. I don't think so. Because when you're gripping reality, you need to have high expectations. No, no, no. (laughs) Gripping reality, you need to have bottomed out expectations. So anything that happens, you're you're good with. No, that's not true. But that's okay. So, you know, so today on gripping reality... We're going to, like, fix everything in the world, right? Because the whole world is in total dither today. That's true. But it's always been that way. (laughs) So nothing is new. You know, I had a conversation with somebody who's 24 this morning. And it was uh, fascinating to talk about history. With a 24-year-old? Yeah. Yeah. They haven't been alive long enough to know anything about history. No, me talking about history. Oh, you were? The history I've lived through, yeah. Got it, okay. Yeah, because I was explaining what it was like when we watched Nixon land on the Capitol. No, it it was at the White House when he landed with a helicopter on the night of the of the State of the Union speech coming back from China when he had just... Open diplomatic. Yeah, I don't know why. That was just an interesting segue. What but does that have to is, do with anything that's going on right now? It doesn't have anything to do with it. I just it has nothing to do with it at all. So <laughs> it's perspective. So what kind of kids do you want when they're in 30 years? That's what I want to know because we talked about that last time. We want to talk about kids that are successful 30 years from now. What does that look like? Put your uh, glasses down. Stop doing that. Just drives here. me crazy. Everybody who ever watches this is going to be, can you put your glasses down? <laughs> They're going to think that I'm really I dumb. know. Then there's no nutrition in the end that comes <laughs> off your earwax, so don't do that either. Jeez. So, so your daughter just had a little baby, and babies traditionally yes. for men like us are just ugly little raisins that are all wrinkled up and look terrible except their mothers love them right so i just heard the ice cubes rattle in your glass just so you know and and they they look relatively ugly and they have hair matted all over and their eyes are all scrunched up they can't talk they can't tell you what they want so so the big question that arises is what are you going to do to this kid as they grow up, um, what are you going to do with them? Maybe the preposition wasn't the right preposition. What are you going to do to them? What are you going to do with them? How are you going to help them grow? And and the better question is, what kind of a kid do you want in 30 years? Now, right. if you ask your daughter, <clears throat> what kind of a kid do you want in 30 years? She's probably going to wipe a poopy do- diaper on your face. I mean, she she that's like... The most inappropriate question. Don't you think my daughter is beautiful right now? Don't you think, don't you just love her to pieces? Okay. All right. Yeah, I got all that. But the question that, that parents struggle with, either they struggle with it now or they're going to struggle with it in 30 years is what kind of a kid do you want 30 years from now? Because the main objective of having a child has to be answered by each parent relative to the family structure and right. and how they use nutrition, how they build family experiences, what do they do for discipline or correction, how do they set standards. Those are all extremely important questions most parents don't think about. If we were going to write a handbook on parenting, which we have not done, Chapter (laughs) is going to be the purpose of parenting. And it's a short chapter. The purpose of parenting is to raise successful adults while they're in your home growing up. That the goal is to help them be successful, discover themselves, build their strengths, understand their capacities, build an internal sense of standards. Uh, connect with God, have good relationships with others. Those are all vital adult skills, character traits, 
values that you want them to have by the time they're 30 years old. The problem is most parents say, I want my kid to be obedient. I want my right. kid to just shut up and listen to me right. and do what I say. So you right. want an adult who just shuts up and does what they're told. Wait a minute. That's actually not the kind of adult that I hope my kid grows into. I hope they right. stand up for themselves. I hope they, right. they uh, can express, can think through what do I really want and how am I going to achieve that? So if that's the case at 30, how does what you do to your kid when they're 17 contribute towards that or right. when they're 11 or when right. they're five or when they're four months old? Those those <clears throat> issues, if you're always keeping in mind, my destination is a successful adult. So I'm trying to do everything I can to and for and with my child, with a, the whole context of what we got as a family, to result in my child being successful in their opinion when they're 30 years old. I hope I have 30-year-old kids, 35, 40, 20, whatever number, of a child who really sees themselves as successful in their own journey. The mm -hmm. question is, how do you get there? That, that's right. really the key question. Well, it's it's, I think it really begins in that that process of s seeing the long game. I, I you know, w I agree with you that when num none of these guys come out with instruction manuals when they come out, you know, I mean, it's like you get it, you get the babe, and that's it. Um, so, where's the instruction manual? Well, there isn't any. And so, well, there are people who will say, well, the Bible is the instruction sure, manual, sure. right? And in terms of principles and standards and values and character, right. great. No. Right. Pick a verse. Right. The problem right. is when your child is two and a half years old and tips over their, their morning breakfast and just laughs their head off because it makes a huge splatter, find a Bible verse for that. That's, that's a real challenge. Or no, when they're exactly. 11 and they stay out after curfew or... They're 17 and they come in with hickeys all over their neck or they're 22 years old and they won't get out of the basement and get a job. Right. Be, find a Bible verse for that. The problem is you can find various pieces that weave into a fabric. You've got to weave the fabric. And that's, right. that's part of the challenge. But, but my point being is that most people, they don't, they don't take a long, they don't do the long game. They, they, don't develop in their mindset, in their own mindset, that this is about launch. This is about the long game of building character in your son or daughter. Now, it's and, essential to note that we have not done scientific studies to know that most parents don't do that, or nearly correct. all, or just a correct. few, or one or two. See, the reality is when we paint a real big brush, Right. Then then we're we're making a statement that we can't back up with anything. So the You're question right. then I is get it. there may our, be people watching this who are gonna get something really good out of it. Right. Because but, Yeah. But I and I agree with that. Okay, so forgive me for doing a broad general brush from the standpoint. The experience in my life has been professionally and just personally of watching it within family structures as well as professionally that I see those, the realities that there is not a long game. There is a reactionary immediate kind of response to situations because I do agree with you. What do I want? I want an obedient kid. Well, all right. Well, what about all the rest of that stuff that goes with this? So then what happens when they turn 18, now they're an adult, and somehow you... In theory. <laughs> in theory, in theory, yes, in theory. Legally, they're an adult. Legally. Okay, they're an adult. For legally. some things. Yeah, yeah. They can't drink in New York, but that's I know, fine. well, legally, they're an adult. They can serve in the military. Sure, they can you know, vote. They can vote. They can do, which, you know, parenthetically... Drives me crazy. If we're going to do one, why don't we do the others? But 
that whole concept of in our social structure, 18 is really that that time where we're going, okay, you're an adult. We don't have any traditions that really celebrate that. But now you're 18, you can vote and you can whatever. Right. Well, the issue comes where how are you preparing them and delivering that, if you will, uh, your you're raising them so that when you get to that point, whatever, whether it's 18 or 21 or 25, whatever that is. Or 15. Or 15, maybe. But you're able to launch them, and they're launching in a way that is successful, constructive. You know, I don't, I don't see people using that mindset of the long game at that point. Right. I see them being reactive. So then the problem comes is when you are supposedly supposed to let them go, put, you know, wind under their wings, uh, the wind is like, no, there's no wind. Okay. You're still doing the same things, but then that starts building into those young people, men and women. You know, I see resentment. Uh, I see total enabling. I see um, um, deceit because I'm I'm playing double double games now, so I can keep mom happy or dad happy all the time because I know how the structure works. I know what's going to keep them happy, but there's no character development. The character development has been lost in that whole aspect of raising your son or daughter. Mm -hmm. And so what we're talking about is developing good character in your son or daughter. And what does that look like? Because really it comes back to the, the two questions, you know, what's this doing to you and what are you going to do about it? So what you're seeing in your son or daughter at this point, okay, what's that doing to you? And what are you going to do about that? With if you have a long game perspective of being proactive and you know the difference between character issues and silliness or developmental issues or foolishness or whatever that is, I see people responding to things that are not character issues, but they're responses of developmental things that are going on in their kid's life, young and old, which you know, older, older kids. So it's like they will let issues that are when they're teenagers that are really, they really shouldn't be foolishness issues. They're very real because now these people are, you know, when they go through puberty, they're thinking abstractly. They don't have a lot of experience, but parents are still trying to deal with character development for concrete, you know, concrete reality in their lives. All right, you're going to have to explain that a little bit more, concrete and abstract. Some people aren't going to understand what you're talking about. Like me, I don't understand what you're talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Okay. (laughs) So. Concrete as in cement. Yeah, I I get it. I get it. So concrete, black and white. Okay, (laughs) rules, regs, the laundry list of all the things you should and should not do. We don't use should and should not. I know, but I'm saying you want to know what concrete is in most people's okay. lives. That's the kind of thing. Okay. You don't do these things and you do these things. Abstract things, love, faith, those kinds of issues that now you're able to start working with because your brain is starting to change and you can get those into some context in your life. I see that all the time. Is it, yeah, when, 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 I mean, I see that frequently with parents where they have a difficult time of shifting that mode of teaching their kids concrete, trying to instill character into them, discipline, obedience, all those things. And now when a young person becomes uh, goes through puberty and starts developing abstract thinking, they still want to deal with all the issues from a concrete standpoint. Um, it's like 
Uh, let's see if I can give a good, oh, a, a good, a good illustration of what I'm talking about would be. Um, when, when, um, when uh, a teenager um, does something wrong, okay, what's the first thing that most parents <coughs> do when they mess up? Like if they stay out too late or they, they, um, you know, they, um, um, Whatever, they get low grades, whatever it is. I don't know what, what you would consider to be a mess up. But what's one of the first things people do? Parents do with their kids. If they drive cars, what do they do? Give them gas they, money? If they mess up, if they're, you know, if they're speeding, they get a ticket. What do they do? What do parents do at that point? They ground them. They take their keys away. They okay. restrict them from being able to use the privilege of the car. Okay. So how does that work for you, though? Who does that really punish? The kid. It punishes the kid? Sure. Because they can't drive and go like a maniac and stay out late and hang out with their friends and play the radio in the car <laughs> and leave the car empty of gas. See, I don't <laughs> like you. Give me another illustration. So well, the, when you say that when a kid messes up, <clears throat> the question that I have is who determines that that's a mess up? The parent okay. may say, I have a standard that you're to be in by, let's say here in New York, uh, a kid who's under 18 is not allowed to drive after nine o'clock at night. So if they come in at 920, not, not 901, you can always argue, right. well, my watch was off a little bit or I, you know, I caught one more red light. I was trying to get home by nine o'clock. I didn't make it. By so you can say that's just a minor issue. But they come in at 920 or they come in at 1020 and uh, you say that's not acceptable. Why? Because you came in at 1020 and you were you had to be in by nine o'clock. You violated the curfew. From the parents point of view, it is very clear that 1020 is 80 minutes after nine o'clock. From the kid's point of view, they came in that night, which is pretty good. <laughs> so, so from their point of view, the idea that they're 80 minutes over curfew is not really wrong. Their, their mentality is it is not really wrong. I was hanging out with my friends who were talking about something really serious. Um, there, there, it was, it's a summer night. It was still light. I was driving very safely uh, on and on. So all the ramifications out of, out of 20 different factors, 19 of them, I was doing the right thing. The one factor of paying attention to the exact minute as the clock tick towards nine o'clock. I didn't pay attention to that, but everything else I was doing was the right thing to do. The parent comes down on you are 80 minutes over. That's it. You're grounded for two weeks. You can't do anything. So the child or the young adult responds to that with resentment, uh, animosity, a sense of self-righteousness. They start building in, in their own mind, these, my values, uh, dominate my parents' values. They're sticklers for the second by second thing. I'm looking at the global picture. I'm much more mature <clears throat> than my parent is. And the parent is saying, but you violated curfews. So now you have a battle. You're not working together. It is not about growing up. By the time the kid's 30, they're not going to be paying attention to the minute by minute by minute. However, that can still be a toxin <clears throat> in their adult relationships that that they play the game of showing up 20 minutes late or an hour and 20 minutes late just to establish their territory. Now it's a style. And what was a momentary issue has now become a much more global issue. That becomes a real uh, when you say you're trying to build character into people, no matter what you do, you're building character. 
-hmm. You're building character. Mm -hmm. You can build a toxic character. You can exactly. build a resistant yeah, right. character. You can be right. build a, a, a laissez-faire character. You're building character no matter what. The reality is, is who pays the penalty of that? The child pays the penalty of that. One of the things you were talking about before is parents trying to enforce standards and rules. And you may have a parent who actually grew up in a family that never taught those philosophical or right. principled aspects. And every time there is a, a challenge or a fixed expectation, they even intelligent, capable, uh, uh, very worldwide people get into a moment, they drop right down into the concrete. I know I did what's wrong, but I don't care. Or I'm in your face anyway to their spouse, to their employer. What, what's really interesting is they fall back into that old pattern, which was reinforced, not necessarily by positive reinforcement, but the negative reinforcement says to a teenager, I won. They sit in their room during time out for two weeks and they're proud of their action that it got their parents goat and it made them the parent really upset and the parent now has to monitor all the behavior for two weeks and the kid is going i exactly. won and you're exactly. looking at no you lost you lost pr the privilege of using the car and the kid is going in their own mind no i won you see how upset you are that's winning to a teenager so now yes. you end up with What's concrete about that? What's philosophical about that? It's really a messy weave that being able to sort some of that stuff out and right. get on the team of helping that young person grow to be the successful adult they want to be. So asking different questions, approaching the whole thing from a different way, that becomes extremely helpful in that long game. And my point is that, thank you for being uh, bringing that clear around, because that was my point, is that who does it really in the end cause the most pain to? It doesn't cause the most pain to the kid because if the kid knows how to play the game, which they do and they're very good at, then they, you're right, they have their parents' goat. They have their parents' attention. They can play the trump card of, hey, I got to go to school now. I've got to go to this thing now. I got to go to this thing. They can drive their parent crazy because why? Sure. The parent parent took the keys from the car where they were able to go and do that. And now the parent has to take care of all that stuff because they they put an edict down and, you know, they put a line in the sand and said, because you were 80 minutes late, okay, you got the 19, but you didn't get the one. So, you know, that's the deal. Back to that whole concept of character, though, if we're taking that, if we're taking that analogy or that example, if you will, and we'll say a better way for you to have this conversation is first off is to listen to your kid. I mean, if you have a young person where you need to figure out, OK, the question is, what was going on? And they say, well, this is what was happening and this is why this happened then that the 19 definitely overshadows the one. I mean, in my mind, if that, if that, if I know my son or daughter and that's where their, their other orientation lies and well, sure, they're also a teenager. Okay. They're going to think like a teenager, but it's always amazing to me in our culture, in our, parenting, how difficult it seems to be for so many of us to be able to think in, you know, to remember what it was like in those years, how you processed in those years, and to be able to relate to that particular, you know, that way of processing. Yeah, is the world different? Sure, it's different. But how we process and, and all of the development and character for us, that stuff has not changed. But the, the pressure upon young men and women has changed in very real ways. 
So the question then comes is how much time do you begin to actually listen to your kids? Because you're going to hear them tell you things that will make all the difference on how you're going to approach parenting that child. But if you don't take the time to listen, if you don't take the effort to build that relationship and to interact at those levels, uh, you're going to you're going to end up in in the same place that the majority of people say in this country they are, and you read the material all the time because I know you didn't end up the, in that place, I didn't end up in that place, but the majority of people is, oh, when they become teenagers, they never talk to you again. You'll never have a real conversation with your kid once they become a teenager. And I go, what are you talking about? The reason you don't have a real conversation with your son or daughter is because you didn't have a real son, a real conversation with your kid when they were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You were not involved in their life. You did not build a relationship. Um, you didn't take the time to figure out what that was. All right. So, 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 say somebody's listening to this podcast and they have an eleven-year-old and they hear you just say you didn't have a conversation. And listen to your child when they were one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine. Now they're eleven, and they're saying, "Okay, what do I do about that now? I can't go back and have those conversations when my child was four, four, or 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 nine. So it's lost. I, I I've lost the game." And the answer is, "No, you haven't lost the game." Exactly. Because the morning you wake game. up and say, "Hey, I'm going to listen to you differently," instead exactly. of trying to create a a <clears throat> set of standards that that control you what i want to do is learn how to enable you to become everything you can be but that's really going to be up to you and i don't know how to do that very well so i'm going to be learning that while you're learning it as well you're a 14 year old or 11 year old growing up through your adolescence i'm a 39 year old or a 44 year old and I'm growing through it with you. I just want you to know it's as hard for me as it is for you. Because right. you, there are things you don't know. And there are things that I also don't know. Right. And, that, and that's, we're on that journey together. And I, and I would probably use a different word than enable. Because that word tends to have such a um, not a real positive connotation in our, in our world. I mean, I would say that I... I want to be here to equip you because I've walked further down the journey and I want, and at the same time, you're going to equip me of where culture is right now because I don't understand all this dynamic. And I think that moves it to a place of where I totally agree with you where we're coming together on this, but, but you're absolutely right to say, Oh, well, I lost the ball game. Like no sense bothering to do that. I'm going, no, you have never lost the ball game when you wake up, one morning and say, I am going to listen to my son or daughter in a way I've never listened to before to figure out what this relationship really is and where it's going and what we can do to build this thing so I can help them be successful in life because I don't want them to have to experience the difficulty, the really tough stuff where I made poor decisions because I never had the right equipping, I never had the right tools, I never had the the ability with somebody walking alongside me to say, "Hey, if you step in that, you're going to twist your ankle, your ankle, okay, and it's going to really hurt." So maybe you might want to go around that hole, you know, that you're dealing with right now because that's a really big pothole emotionally, you know. So that that concept of being able to take the time to hear that and to to build on that is so important. And I would come back and say there's going to be people who are listening to hopefully our the podcast that are starting out. They have young children, okay? And I'm, I'm here to tell you that if you will build a relationship with them when they are young and you not their best buddy you're their mom, you're their dad, but you have a relationship with them that holds that, if you will, that 
kind of dynamic as being sacred, which we don't use that word much anymore, but it really is true. I mean, that was always the, <laughs> that was always one of the jokes. I, you know, I'll never forget when my youngest came home one day from high school and she said, uh, so, uh, so you're like my friend, right? And I looked at her and I said, well, no, I'm not your friend. I'm your dad. She, and she went, what? I go, no, I, I'm your dad. I'm not your friend. <laughs> and it was like, she, she just couldn't because she was hanging out with all these people that, you know, their parents weren't being parents. They were being their friends. Now, right. now that they're, they're grown adults, <laughs> that whole thing changes. Well, changes. one of the challenges is, in, and it seems to be different now than it was when we were young children in the 60s, 50s and 60s, is that adults in, in the last 40, 50 years, adults became struggled to move into authentic adulthood and separate from their own adolescence. Yes. So uh, the, when, when I was a young kid and all the way through my teenage years, the parents of my friends, I don't even know to this day what their first names were. Right. They were Mr. Mr. Or Mrs. Or Mrs. Right. And right. grandma, maybe grandma last name, I might have referred to as somebody sure. who's an sure. elder generation. But the idea of somebody who who was older than I was being referred to by name was just impossible to imagine. And now right. the school principal is Principal Bob or Principal Julie or you know, I right. mean, that, now it's like, I want you to know my first name so that I'm your peer when you're five or 13 or 19 years right. old. And the, and so it's a different world than what right. we had grown up in. So right. from the kid's point of view, there is less automatic respect Correct. accorded to a person who is in a different generation. But there's also the struggle for a different kind of respect when you're in that age. That that becomes a, a gigantic challenge. Right, right, absolutely. Because now that familiarity really leaves, I mean, it makes it very difficult to have that kind of dynamic of development of character because you're not, you're not even seeing, not that I think there needs to be this hierarchical kind of thing going on, but the very real aspect of this is that as I always say, is that I may not have all the answers, but I definitely have more mileage. And so, you know, the difference between an adolescent who is now a young adult is not the fact that they can't think abstractly. The difference is experience, is that they don't have mileage. And yeah, their brain is developing and all that stuff. And I know that. But now they're able to think abstractly, but they do not have, they don't have the years of experience of good and not so good in your life of figuring out what works and doesn't work. So when we, when we, when we bring it all down, then that's really difficult for there to be that transfer of, of understanding of what, what you're trying to do in equipping someone and developing their character. I don't know if that makes okay, sense. Okay, so that touches on a subject that probably would be good for our next podcast. And that, that is, is like... how does a human being learn or gain knowledge, wisdom, and maturity? And follow what I'm saying. There are two primary avenues. There are many sub-avenues. we got to reduce very complex issues down to something simple. Right. There is either vicarious learning, l learning, or there is experiential learning. Okay. Experiential learning is how do I know a screwdriver should not be inserted into a wall socket? How do I right. know that? Right. How do I have maturity not to take a metal knife and put it into the wall socket where we normally plug in a light. There are two ways of learning the maturity of 
not taking a metal knife and putting it into one of those slots in the wall. One is, I was told this is going to shock you if you do that. So I learned from someone else's experience, do not stick a knife into the wall socket. That's vicarious learning. I read it in a book. I saw it in a movie. Somebody right. else experienced it. My older brother said, my, my dad said, my mom said, the experiential learner says, hey, that sounds like a cool idea. And they take a metal knife and stick it into the wall socket and they get the shock of their life at 110 volts. And then they do it again. And then do it again. They say, what is wrong with you? You keep shocking yourself and throwing the circuit breaker. Why in the world are you doing that? Well, it's fun. It, what is fun about that? You're like burning your fingers and melting the knife. The reality is I'm an experiential learner. I learn on my own. You just gave me a great idea. Am I going to get a ticket when I drive 90 miles an hour in my neighborhood? You might, but you might not. So a kid who then says, hey, I was driving 90 miles an hour and nothing happened. That was great. It was thrilling. My friends were all, I'm a vicarious learner. So as you're growing your child towards adulthood, every human being learns some things vicariously and some things experientially. But there are human beings that nearly everything they really learn is going to come from experience. Right. You can talk to them till you're blue in the face, right. screaming red in the face, blanched out, scared to death, white in the face. Doesn't make any difference. Your kid's an experiential learner. And others are vicarious learners who read books, watch other behaviors, and they just learn. So that would be good for us to explore in a little bit more depth. How do you know if your child is primarily a vicarious learner or primarily an experiential learner? And if you are a parent of an experiential learner, what do you do? Because <laughs> they're going to climb every mountain, jump into every pit, yeah. Try every law and rule. They're going to right. do that, and you're going to be insane or right. dead by the time they reach adulthood. Or a vicarious learner is going to pester <clears throat> you with, well, why? Why, Dad? Why, Mom? Why do they do right. that? What does that mean? Right. Why do they do that? Well, can right. you stop asking me questions? So <laughs> that would be good for us to explore next time in terms of vicarious various experiential parenting. and. Here's another kicker. If you're a vicarious learner, but your kid is an experiential oh, learner. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, absolutely. that's going to be luck. fun. Let's talk yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah, because I have those in my family. I have multiples of different sure. things. So, so, and we will talk about those dynamics of what that does between siblings and how that works. Oh, yeah, that's a good one, too. Woo, yeah. We got a lot to talk about. <laughs> Anyway, I got to go pretty soon, so tie this together, make it All look right. really, really pretty. And Well, okay, so if we're – and we're going to come back. Um, you know, we talked about in our last podcast, too, that we want to come back and we want to talk about uh, the realities of uh, – and we want to be real careful and sensitive to this – of suicide kinds of issues that happen with, with young men and women uh, and what that looks like in, in some of the dynamics of – of where that comes from. And I think that that's part and parcel of what drives what we're talking about here is that, is that if you are, if we're about uh, raising up and equipping young men and women to be successful at 30, you know, I guess my, my people say, well, okay, this is really nice. You guys have said nice things, yada, 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 yada. But hey, give me something. Give me something to go with here. You know, what What can I do to begin this process that, you know, that, that really is going to help me 
be able to see a successful young man or woman when they're 30 years old. What, 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 where, you know, give me something. So I, I guess to me, you know, let's boil it down to a couple things. One is that you, to begin with, I would really encourage you to have, you know, the long, you got to get the long view of what this looks like. The reactionary view is going to cause nothing but, I mean, it really is going to cause nothing but angst and strife, and you're going to be frustrated with yourself because you're not taking a long view that says, okay, what am I looking at? That would be the second question, is when you are trying to help a, a young man or woman grow is to really begin to ask that question, what am I looking at? That comes with listening and spending the time trying to figure out what it is you're looking at. Uh, in relationship to the development of their character. Is this what's going on? Is this something that really is a character issue? Or is it really not? It's just silliness. It's just life. It's just whatever. What I see happening multiple times in, in family relationships is you've, I see parents willing to pardon the expression, die on the sword for something that really is not a character issue in a kid's life. You know, I mean, again, back to your, back to your analogy, I mean, your, your, your illustration, which I think is a very good one, is that are you willing to die on the sword? In other words, you're willing to cause total disruption in your relationship because he didn't get home on time, 80 minutes, he was 80 minutes late, and you didn't bother to listen to the rest of the story because you were so angry that you had to stay up and you were inconvenienced because you lost your sleep because he was up and you were worrying about him and you didn't know where he was and yada, 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 yada. And who was the person that was really upset? Him or you? And were you upset because of what, you know, you were concerned about his safety and character and everything that was being developed? Or were you really angry because you were inconvenienced because you had to stay up and now you're really inconvenienced because you made this edict that says, give me the keys, you're grounded for two weeks. Right, but that's with a benign issue like showing up 80 minutes late after curfew and nothing really happened. But it becomes really a challenge when you have a 14-year-old who comes home drunk from a party exactly. or they went a little too far sexually in the car or on a date when they're 16 or 17 years old, right. or right. they act uh, with incredible injustice and disrespect to a person who has disabilities or is racially different or from a different right. socioeconomic right. level. And, and, and looking at that and saying, hey, I heard this really funny joke and it's about a geek who has uh, missing one leg. You say, don't tell me the story. Right. Because what you're doing is building into your life a disrespect for people that have a disability or speak another language. Um, I know you're finding it funny, but I don't even want to hear that story. I don't want it in my mind. So now the question you have is not with a benign issue, but with something that actually could alter their life forever. Right, How exactly. do you deal with that? So in terms of what's a tool uh, that you have Here's a tool that I would recommend. When you are in an interaction with your child or your spouse, do you find that you already have your next statement prepared in your mind before the other person you're talking with has even finished their statement? Monitor, listen actually to yourself. Right. So when a the child is coming in late, your spouse burned dinner, somebody has a birthday party coming up, and you're already forming your answer before you have even listened to what they have to say. Address that first. Throttle it back. And even admit it. They're talking and to say, I'm, I'm learning this right now. This is hard for me. I've already got an answer. I'm going to put that to the side. Say what you said again. And I want to listen to it. And then I want to tell you what you just said as I heard it. So you make a comment. I'm learning 
not to have an answer right. already on my lips right. before you're done talking right. or acting. Right. So the question then is, how do I learn that skill? That's an incredible skill that that will will pay m major dividends later on if I can learn how to say, I've already formed an answer but I'm going to stop myself from doing that. Say what you just said again, because I didn't hear it. Right. Now your right. child goes, what? Where'd that right. come from? Oh, it came from right. a podcast from Mike and Mike. But that's beside the point. <laughs> Where I learned it is not important. The right. question is, can you say what you said again? Right. And I'm going to stop myself from having an answer already formed and coming out of my mouth. That's a skill. And, Go yes. ahead. And well, and one of the things that I do, uh, in 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 that very thing, that very thing that you're talking about, because that's so critical, is that in, is instead of coming and always thinking of an answer, is I actually say, okay, I'm help me understand. I'm help me, because I'm the guy that's trying to figure out what you're saying and what you, what went on here. And so when I when you do that, then all of a sudden it puts them in the driver's seat that says, I'm listening to you, but I'm trying to understand and I don't really understand yet. So try this again and then repeat back to them what you heard them say and ask them for affirmation if that's really what they're trying to say to you. That is huge because yeah. that means you that means you have set aside your answer and the 14 things you want to tell them about how to get this all sorted out and it's put the playing field really level that just says and actually it's put it in their their ballpark there where they're able to really be in the driver's seat because i genuinely am sitting here saying okay i don't understand i really want to understand help me understand what what went on here? What what's going on? What are you thinking? How did this come about? And not an interrogation standpoint, but trying and then be able to reflect that back to them in very very succinct and real terms. I mean, you're going to find that that kind of dynamic not only with your kids but just generally when you're doing that with people. I mean, we do this all the time. I mean, I, we have tons of verbiage between the two of us, but we do this where we actually listen to see what is it and i'll say okay i don't i don't get this help me understand what you're trying to say here and then we come back at it again until it becomes clearer and clarity then when you have clarity in what has gone on then you can start to have a real discussion which we would say is at the top of the ladder when you start talking about motivational kinds of things that help you come to come some kind of resolution for the benefit of both of you and with you always having the long game in mind in your in your head is like we're talking about successful 30 year old here okay but it starts at that kind of basic line that baseline and that basic uh beginning of of using that kind of ability to really have those real real conversations and relationship so in 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 Talking about uh, this conversation that you're having with a spouse or with your child or with a neighbor or anybody, one of the challenges that we face is how do we stack the values that are going to drive actually our response? Right. So if we say we're going to be talking about something, I really want you to be honest with me and tell me your mind, tell me your thinking on this. And the individual you're speaking with, a child or a neighbor or a spouse or anybody, takes the bait and tells you honestly what they're thinking. And your response is, you blow up. You say, okay, I did not know you lied to me about that yesterday. Now, you're grounded for a month. The child right. is going to say, okay, I deserve to be grounded, but I am never going to be honest again. Exactly. So exactly. then you have to decide of the values I'm trying to teach is honesty, clarity, what you, the word you used was being, having clarity, right. is that really what I want to instill in my child? Because if they share something 
extremely difficult. They won't do that up front. That very first time, they're, they're not going to do something at risky. But if they share something that is really compromising and you blow up about that or that becomes a control mechanism or now you have leverage, they will learn in that moment not to be honest. They'll learn to be cagey. They'll learn to assuage the truth a little bit so it comes across a little bit better. But they may not know how to be honest, how to be transparent. And the challenge then is my response is going to determine, maybe even lifelong, how my child deals with truth, transparency, clarity, honesty, those kinds of things. And if they learn by experience, not by vicarious instruction, but by experience every time or in critical moments, when I am being transparent and honest, the consequences of that are dire. They're too right. negative. I, I, I break up with my, my boyfriend or girlfriend. Come home, the kid's a little weepy. Tell me what's going on. Right. I really want to hear what's going on in your life. The kid decides, you know, it, it's worth the risk. I, 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 I'm really hurting. I, I'm hurting because I feel like I got stabbed in the back and, and I, this is just painful. And your response, which already formed in your mouth is, you know, I told you so. I told you this is going to happen with that particular girl, that guy, uh, because I've seen this thing kind of thing before. And I know really the kid is going, you didn't even hear me, did you? Right. You don't even care that right. this is a wound for me. This is hurting for me. And I don't know what to do about it. What would be a good response instead of I told you so is I really don't know what you're going through, but this is really obviously important right. to you. Right. Can I have permission to hear what you're feeling? Right. Tell me what you're feeling. Not right now. I'm good with that. Right. I I'll just want you to know I'm on your yeah. side. And let me give you a, a, a flip side to that, which is also equally as damaging. OK, from that standpoint, is that when you have we'll just take that scenario um, where you come home and your son or daughter is weepy. Let's take your son is weepy because his girlfriend just dumped him. He's really. Um, maybe he had been maybe he had been uh, physically had gone too far than what he should have. They didn't have intercourse, but, you know, they were. They were messing around. Bonding. And, and, there's a bonding thing going yeah, on. Bonding. To what level, you don't know. There's bonding yeah, going exactly. on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so there's bonding. Going. But so you sit down and you listen to it and you are empathetic and you are saying, well, you know, when, you know, when I was your age, this happened to me and it was devastating and I really, it was really tough. And, you know, so, and I, I understand, but so, hey, do you, do you mind if like I check back on, you know, how you're feeling and, and what you're thinking, you know, from time to time and make sure that it's okay and you're okay. And you never do it as a parent. You sure. You don't follow back. up. You don't follow up. You don't come back. You don't, you know, you don't, you don't find out how they're doing emotionally. And obviously as you watch your son walking around the house, you see that he's still crushed. He's still struggling. But because your wounds were so great from what happened to you, you don't want to go back there. You don't want to deal with that. And so you you just don't ever bother. You find you find ways not to ever bother to, to follow up. And that kind of thing of, of you not being willing to deal with your own aspect of your hurt to be able to identify with that deep kind of wound with your son or daughter and to be vulnerable a bit at that level, then really does the same thing. It does the same thing with the son or daughter that says, you know what, I'm never talking to him again about anything that deep because they don't care. He said he was going to check up on me, never bothered to ask me, never bothered, came back, never said a word, you know, and just even though I was weepy and I was struggling and, you know, and I was acting out, Never said a word. So the, one of the challenges of that whole scenario is the idea that empathy 
arrives from identity that when your child says, I just got dumped by my girlfriend and it really hurts. If the parent then shifts storyline to their own journey, it says to the child, your journey really is not all that important. I'm right. going to tell you my story. Right. And the only way I can, can uh, walk alongside you is if I tell my story of how hurtful it was to me. Right. What that does then is supplants your right. child's it story. The right. it, invalidates right. it invalidates their them. story. Right. I get that. So instead of doing that, to, instead of saying, I understand what you're going through because I went through it as well. And that's a preformed statement that's in line with what I said before. Instead of doing that, saying, tell me what you're feeling, if you can. Right. Right. And if you can't, I'm also good with that. There are feelings that sometimes are so raw or so deep, you don't have words for them. Right. Or right. you don't have words yet. Right. So I'm good for that. I just want you to know you're, what you're going through right now is really important to me. Not and that I went through it, but what no, you're going through no, is important and I would to me. Agree with, and I would agree with that. I think that, that the point being, though, is that when you say this is really important to me and you never bother. And you never write. That, that, that's a failure. That's a failure of commitment. Right. And that then puts you in the same place as you blowing up and saying, see, I told you so. Sure. Because then yes. the kid goes, I'm never sharing with you guys again, because you know what? You said you were going to help me and you just left me out here to right. flounder. And I have been floundering badly. So screw you. I'm just not going to do that. Right. Uh, I mean, and, I, and the solution, the helpful, the, what a, a technique or a tool, maybe even a challenge point is instead of, of a commandeering or hijacking the story from what's really front and central to any other aspect about me, about your mother, about your father, about right. your grandmother, about the neighbor down the street, about what right. happened in Bible right. times, that all of those things hijack the storyline from what the individual you're talking to is actually struggling with. Right. And to be able right. to say what you are going through is important to me because you are important to me. Exactly. And I don't really know how to help you process right now. I just want you to know I, I value what is happening. That right. You are important to me. And right. then everything else is going to line up after that. Right, right. All right, we got to finish. So if you want to watch, you want to see more of this kind of stuff, I mean, you got questions. Where do we go? Grip the reality. best thing to do, this, is, this show is called Gripping Reality by Mike and Mike. I spell Mike with a Y. You spell it normally. You're a normal person. Spell it with an I. You can pick either Mike, Mike at grippingreality.com or Mike at grippingreality.com. <laughs> but don't send it to Mike or Mike or Mike and Mike because it won't go anywhere. Mike at Gripping Reality or Mike at Gripping Reality. <clears throat> Spell it with a Y or an I. We will get the email. We will deal with your questions. That's right. All or right. your response or your yeah. criticism. Whatever your comments. or you're telling us you're never watching us idiots again, <laughs> and we will talk about that in a future podcast. But you won't know it because you're not watching. You're not watching. <laughs> Good for us. Too bad for you. All right. Later. Thanks. See ya. Bye.